Thank you for joining us again tonight. We're studying another lesson on church history. This will be our last in this first section of church history. And at the end, we'll talk about the fact of what we're going to look at next time and when that will be. But this will be the last one for about three or four uh, month, or Thursday nights. We're going to talk tonight about the rise of power of Roman Catholicism how it came about, how they developed the system that they have, and how it is that the power that is controlled there is central in its nature, and what effect that would have had on the people then. Then we'll move into next time during the medieval times. Notice how Catholicism totally dominated uh, a society, especially a society in which it was very illiterate. As we look at it, we notice the fact that doctrinal error tends to come first. We've noticed this several times, and then after that, organizational error comes. We noted that in Bible times. We noted it in the first century as well of how that took place. And then with those, whether it be the doctrinal error or the organizational, there's going to be a moral decline that comes with any apostasy that's away from the will of God. Last time we noted how it is that in the first century in the New Testament, we find that every church had their own bishops, plural. In other words, bishops, elders, shepherds, all of those pastors were talking about the same people. Both in 1 Peter chapter 5 and in Acts chapter 20, you find them called all of those terms, elders, overseers, bishops, uh, pastors or sh uh, shepherds. And so when you look at that term or those three terms that are used, they're used of the same men. There were always a plurality of them in New Testament times in each church. But as it moved on, it came to be where one of those men called an elder or an overseer, a, uh, a pastor or shepherd, was elevated to be called a bishop, and he was seen to be the one that was over that. And then what happened is you had the city bishops take the place of the country bishops. They were just phased out. And then you had the metropolitans in a few specific cities that had more power than others. Then you had it narrowed down to where the uh, bishops in both Rome and Constant, uh, Constantinople were the ones who had most power. And finally, then you have the Roman Catholic bishop reigning from the throne there in uh, Rome. And so we looked at how that kind of thing developed. It took on more the power of what you have in the Roman Empire. And as the Emperor Constantine became the one who not only legitimized Christianity, but in essence made it the state religion, what you did was dilute the church with many who were not very spiritually minded. They were carnally minded. And as a result of that, the church, as it was looked at then, goes more and more into an apostasy that moved away from being the church we see in the Word of God to what they had of a church made by man. And that point that was made on Constantine as well that when he saw a, an issue arise among Alexander and Arius regarding uh, the nature of Christ, whether he was one who was uh, truly uh, both man and God, that he was human and divine at the same time the flesh, or if one dominated the other. The idea that was there of Alexander was that he taught that there was a unity of the Trinity. In other words, there was that which was an absolute unity of the same nature and substance were the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Arius taught, however, that Christ was above man, but he was below God. And so there is not that unity of divine nature between them. We looked at the point of the Council of Nicaea. Constantine called this as the emperor. He saw himself as the head of the church. And the idea was when you pull all of the bishops together, when they decide a matter, then that's inspired of God. God had led them in that, they believed. That started the whole principle that was pointed out of what took place from councils. 
And still today, there is that council that would join together if uh, the Catholic Church decides it needs to have some decision on a particular matter. Indeed, the last one was in the early 1960s that you had the council that was called Vatican II, and uh, there were a number of changes made within it. When you look at these councils, here's the point. You had the bishops join together. These are bishop, bishops already starting into apostasy had the idea that the church was vested, in other words, those who were the ecclesiastical ones, the priests and so forth. These bishops, they thought, were given the tradition that came from God. In other words, when Jesus went out of the way and his apostles with them, that the apostles left behind the church as a power that would keep on ruling and deciding what was truth. Now, it's obvious that that's different from what we've looked at of the New Testament church. The New Testament church looks and, and sees for, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God or that the scripture is inspired of God, probable for doctrine, reproof, correction, for understanding and righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, furnished completely to every good work. Scripture claims that it is the source of authority. But the Catholic Church claimed that there was a source of authority above the Bible, and that was the tradition that was there of the church. That's why it is when we talk with our Catholic friends about what the Bible says, and we say, look, this is not what you're doing. You're not doing what the Bible says. To them, that doesn't matter a whole lot. The idea is, which is it that has that power or authority? Is it the so-called church that through the ecclesiastical power, it decides what truth is? Or is it the word of God that decides what truth is? And that's stagnant in its nature. Fact is, we've looked at this already, that the New Testament claims that it is the final revelation of God to men, and that anyone that goes away from that and teaches something else is to be anathema. We've noted several times how that point is that whatever we do in word or in deed, we do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him, Colossians 3.17 that that is where we find in the authority of Jesus Christ as given by his apostles. You look at John 14 through 16, you notice the same things, that here you have Christ leaving the apostles, this is the night that he is betrayed, and he points out to them that he'll send them the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will guide them to all truth. When you look at scripture, it's very plain that the claim is that Christ through the Holy Spirit delivered the gospel to those in first century times, to those who were inspired by the Holy Spirit so that they were able to reveal things, all things that God wanted man to know. When you had the Holy Spirit both reveal those things and confirm them through the miracles that were done, there was no longer a need for miraculous action because that miraculous action was for the purpose of being that guarantee or that seal to show that this indeed came from God. But if you're from Catholicism, the idea is that Jesus had all this authority and instead of vesting that in the apostles preaching the word and that word being the form of authority, their idea is it continued to be passed on through the bishops of the church, and they would decide what truth was. Well, after the council at Nicaea and the development of the first creed from that, then you have the next thing happened is the council at Constantinople. The emperor uh, 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 Theod Theodosius, Theodosius, it was his name, he was the one who brought this together. There were 150 bishops in that attendance. And he reaffirmed, or the council reaffirmed, the same decisions that were made at Nicaea. They discussed the nature of the Holy Spirit as well. And they taught that the Holy Spirit, some of them said, was less than the Father and Son on the level with the angels or a highly elevated 
angel. However, the council decided and they affirmed that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and is worshiped together with the Father and the Son. In other words, if he proceeds from the Father, he is of the same nature as the Father. Regarding the nature of Christ, they went back and decreed that Christ was both human and divine at the same time. They condemned a man by the name of Apollinarius, who said that Christ had a human body and soul, but his divine spirit was that which was God or deity. In other words, he said that logos, that divine spirit there, is that which goes back to God. So parts of him were God, parts of him were human, according to this council. Well, of course, the problem is that they were trying to decide on something that the scripture did not reveal. The scripture merely says that he was man and that he was God. And that we believe that, that he was both divine and human, endowed with those things that man and divinity have. And that is all we know about it. The how is not explained in scripture. And when you have people start to do this, they start to go in a way that gets away from God. I think we saw the same thing among some of our brethren some uh, oh, 30 years ago or so when there started to be many discussions about the idea of how Jesus was divine on the earth or whether he left his divinity in heaven and came down was just a man here on this earth. Well, the point is scripture affirms that he was both. Not only was he divine in eternity, John 1, 1 through 3, but he also is that same one, the Logos, the eternal Logos, who came and dwelt in the flesh, John 1, 14 through 17. And so the fact is, he is both at the same time. I don't need to explain how that is. I couldn't possibly do it. I don't know. That's one of the secret things that belong to God, Deuteronomy 29, 29. But that is the affirmation of Scripture. We leave it simply with that. When they got away from that and went into philosophy, then they're taking more and more of positions that God did not state in Scripture. We're going to notice the effect of that. The next thing that happened is a few uh, years later in 431, you had the Council of Ephesus. And this was regarding the nature of Christ again. In other words, this is the third one in a row where they're still talking about the nature of Christ. They decreed that Christ had perfect unity in being and personality, not different parts. I don't know what that means, do you? Because I don't find those terms used in Scripture. Can I affirm that Christ, the Father, the Spirit, had perfect unity? Absolutely. Go to John 17 and you'll see that very clearly. Now, what does that mean? Were there different parts of this? Was there a human part and a divine part? That's what they're trying to get down to. And the fact of it is they're saying there's nothing there. Again, they're trying to explain how this happened. This council gave rise to the popular use of the saying from the Nicene Creed that Mary was the mother of God. When you look at that term, Mary was the mother of God, the point of that was never to exalt Mary. In other words, that wasn't what it was intended to do. What was intended by that was to exalt Jesus. Instead of one thinking he became divine somewhere in, being ha uh, in having that divinity to come on him after the birth, they said, no, he was deity as he was coming into this world as a baby. The fact of it is, he was worshipped by those who came to him when he was a baby. That's how I know he was divine. He accepted there was no rebuke of that in Scripture of him being worshipped in that way. There was also a controversy then that came from that. While they intended that statement, Mary was the mother of God, now they had a problem. Now with Mary tied together with deity, then they're going to try to answer, okay, how could she have done that? How can she, being human, 
and one who is merely human, how could she have deity within her as she was giving birth to Jesus? Again, the scripture does not tell us that. But the idea is, if I've taken the one position that she was the mother of God, now they're going to have to explain some other things rather than just say, we don't know how. God said it was so, and that's all. They get the problem as they go into that more and more. The emphasis then changed to be an exaltation of Mary. And that's exactly where we are today. The point is, when you use non-biblical language, there is a consequence to it every time. We may not see that at the point that we're using that terminology. But when we recognize that it is not biblical, we need to go back and say, wait, what does the scripture say? We say Bible things in Bible ways. That those things that are given from scripture, we affirm as the scripture does, not by our human philosophy. Well, after that, barely 20 years, and we have another council come along, and that's the council at Chalcedon. This one, again, talked about the nature of Christ. Eutyches was one who came along, and he was still trying to answer that question. How is this that he is divine and human? And what he said is that he had two natures. He had the nature of God, but it was fused together with the nature of man as well. And those two natures were fused in such a way that after the incarnation, then you have him being both. Now think about that. Does the scripture say that? Two natures. That there is the nature of human that he has and the nature of divine. That's going to get them into several problems. Number one, it's going to get them into discussing what is the nature of God and the nature of humanity. And they got off on that as well, taking the idea that man has inherited sin and some other things from Augustine, who tries to affirm that. But that is an idea that in the end was, as Eutyches put it, it was one that he looked at it as merely saying that Jesus was human. He wasn't really. And the idea was he used his deity there to overcome the desires of his humanity, which makes the statements from Hebrews about him being tempted in all points as we are yet without sin somewhat of a problem because if he did that, he really did not suffer and was tempted like I am and like you are. So here we go into these good meaning attempts to explain, but they end up with further problems. Leo of Rome, he's the bishop that's from there at the time, said Christ was at once both complete in Godhead and complete in manhood of Mary, the God-bearer. Now he stepped it up one. Mary had to be the God-bearer, the one who gave birth to God. Now, that's going to bring about more problems. The council said that when Peter uh, was speaking, he spoke through Leo. In other words, he is the one that they believed the church was founded on, Peter. And so Peter was speaking through Leo, and they adopted that view at that point. Then the Virgin Mary was taken to be the mother of God, and they made that a mandatory confession that one had to confess that the Virgin Mary is the mother of God. Now, what happens from this? Let me just trace out the future on this one just for a moment, if you might. If the idea is accepted that Mary, a virgin, is the mother of God there, the question is, what was within her womb? The idea, well, that's God within her womb. But you put that together with Augustinian thought, and that is that man is corrupted. He has inherited sin that he earns from, or that he gets from Adam. Now, if that inherited sin abides in that person, Mary, and yet Jesus does as well, you can't have that. So now they're going to have to say, no, no, Mary 
had an immaculate conception too. It was not something that was there. She was one who was cleared of any original sin. Now you might guess already, but what is the problem then? How did Mary's mother have both no original sin and original sin abiding in her? The problem is that you've got to go all the way back to the beginning to address that if you start it. But all of that starts because the language being used is not that which scripture talks about. Also in the Council of Chalcedon, they have the equality of now two bishops. Those two are Constantinople and Rome. They're above every other metropolitan, and they're supposedly going to have equal authority, but over time, Rome gets more and more and more in the so-called Western uh, Church, the Catholic Church. And you have more and more going to Constantinople in the Eastern groups, what we would sometimes call the Orthodox movement as it came to be. So you had these two starting to split even back in this time. Rome ruled the West, Constantinople ruled the East. Well, then we have a couple of councils. They're put together there because they're ones that uh, both took place in Constantinople. Now, the empire very clearly having its headquarters or its capital in Constantinople. The Council of 553 said that Eutyches' sin, sin, uh, single nature of Christ, in other words, monto, uh, monophysitism, continued to be held despite the condemnation. That is what Arius had said, that he has that lesser of nature. So they said that is still being held by some. They condemned it again. They discussed and reaffirmed their rejection of monophysitism, and they did that with other issues as well. And influential leaders changed sides on this time and time again until the point that everybody had been on both sides of that at some time almost, it's told to us. Well, that was a weak council. So now, after about 120 years, you have another one come about, the council at Constantinople from 680. Some taught that Christ had two natures, but he only had one personality and will. The council sustained the two-nature idea. They agreed with that, but they rejected one will and personality as a denial of real temptation. And you see, here's the point. They're trying to get into these ideas. How do we explain his real temptation and that which had to do with uh, his real suffering in the flesh? They decided they would try to do it with non-biblical language, and the problem is apparent. They condemn those teaching that there is only one will, but there had to be two wills, and now we have two wills, two natures. So what is that other will that Jesus had? You see, the point of this is, does he have a will towards doing evil that is against God? Augustinian thought said yes. And yet that gives them the same problem that this God within Mary idea gives them. They've got a problem any way they want to go about it. They come back to Nicaea, 787 at that point. And they start to have another that begins to divide the church in the East and West, as it's called, the apostasy of this church of man. The iconoclastic controversy, the controversy over images is all that means, like the statues that are given. You see, images had been used since the fourth century, the 300s. And so what happened is the crucifix now is coming to be used and it's used in their worship greatly at that time. But the churches in the East opposed the use of images. They didn't like that. They said, that's idolatry. And idolatry is to be condemned. And they said, we can only use flat images that they call icons. Now I'd ask you, where do you find the difference between those in the Bible? That you can use a three, or that you can use a 2D uh, kind of an image 
as an illustration of something, something that's merely flat on the surface. But if you have a 3D one, then that's evil, that's wrong, that's idolatry. The fact of it was you can make a 3D or a 2D image into that which is an idol if you have some sense in which it receives some special place of honor. The church in the West, however, those under mostly the control or the, uh, I guess you would say, influence of Rome, they favored the use of those 3D images, the statues. They said God was in the image just as Christ was in the Lord's Supper. By this time, you see, they've taken a position that Christ is actually in the Lord's Supper, what they call the Eucharist. Now, if you look there, is it his flesh actually and blood? No, you can't see that. It's not visible, but he's there in some way, in a mystical sense. And they said the same goes with the images. Therefore, the image is the actual representation of the invisible. And somehow the two of those are kind of mystically fused together. The council decided that God alone is to be worshiped, but the image could be venerated. Now there's another one. Where do you see the distinction between veneration and worship? The idea is they say we can only worship God, but we can venerate all of these images out here in various saints, they claim. Their problem is now they believe that Mary is more than just a saint. Within a few years, I don't think it's going to be very long, they've already taken several steps toward it. Catholicism has decided that Mary is the co-mediatrix of Jesus. If she is the co-mediator, she has to be part divine. Paul speaks to Timothy and saying the mediator is not a mediator of one. In other words, if you only have one that is there that's represented, then you don't have a mediator. If you have management and labor getting together, the management is going to accept somebody from management, but labor won't. Labor is going to accept somebody from labor, but management won't, but it won't do that. So what do they want? They want someone from both sides of this that has experience. If you have deity and humanity being brought together in that mediation, if Jesus was both divine and human, and Mary is now the co-mediatrix, what are they going to have to claim? In the end, it's going to have to be merely more than what they call veneration. It's going to have to be worship. And more and more, that's what you see with regard to the use of Mary in Catholicism. But the point is, Scripture does not make that distinction of worship and veneration. Worship is that which is the honor as belonging to God as the greater being. And that is all that we know about it. There's nothing said about this veneration matter. Now, what came down from all of this? Well, you had the establishment as these councils were meeting. They were trying to establish Catholicity. That meant universal. What was accepted as doctrines and organizations that were approved universally? That means in the council, as the majority would carry the will there, the majority of the bishops, what is the practice and belief of the majority of bishops? Whatever that is, that's what Catholicism believes at the time. May change over time. But they're trying to determine through all of this what has Catholicity. And they're also trying to notice about uh, uh, sacerdotalism. Uh, uh, sacerdotalism, there it is. And that is the teaching that you have the ordination of priests and bishops and so forth, the ordination for special ability and power, they need to give that from the church. Only then is that one endowed with some ministry and able to ordain from the grace that is bestowed upon him by the church. 
The Catholic concept is that their saints and others had such superior righteousness that they lived in a way that was more good works than they needed to be saved. And so what happens? We can apply for or ask for those good works to overcome some of our bad works, and then supposedly the church helps us to come into that place of being acceptable before God. But to bestow that grace on someone, you have to be ordained. And that's where this comes from. When you look at the idea of baptism, their thought was there's power in the act itself. They added elements to baptism, for instance, holy water that could be used, giving a special power to it. The salt that they would put on the head after one was baptized or as they were, that gave that preserving element, supposedly. That after they were baptized, they were raised and given milk and honey to symbolize them entering into the promised land. All of these things very clearly were done through these various times, including infant baptism, though that is not what's done in New Testament times. Either there is a very clear passage from Acts chapter 8 when Philip comes to the one who's in the chariot, this one in the chariot, the Ethiopian uh, treasurer there, he asked Philip, see, here's water. What hinders me to be baptized? Philip says, if you believe, you may. Now, what did that mean? If you believe, you may be baptized. But if you do not, what? The opposite side of that is if you do not believe, you're not ready to be baptized. Well, does a baby believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? No, that's impossible. But you see, the idea is here's something that's an act that gets grace dispensed to that individual from the church. Of course, we understand that that infant unlike Augustinian thought, does not have an inherited sin. Ezekiel chapter 18 points that out very clearly in verse 20 when it says, the soul that sins, it shall die. The father shall not bear the iniquity of the son, neither shall the son bear, bear the iniquity of the father. The righteousness of the righteous will be on him and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Very plain. They had a doctrine that they had to sustain and it went further and further, you see, in things that they developed that were away from the will of God. The so-called Eucharist, that this is the actual sacrifice of Christ. Catholics believe that when the Mass is said, then there is that actual crucifixion of Jesus again. He is freshly crucified. That's why they believe in the transubstantiation of the elements, the bread and the fruit of the vine they become the actual non-bloody body and blood of Jesus Christ. Their idea is mystically they become that. They increase the number of sacraments beyond just those two original ones there and had many other things come about. Confirmation, penance, ordination, unction, marriage were all those that were added. Confirmation and ordination both required the bishop, one of a level of a bishop or better, to be able to do those. When you look at those seven sacraments, the idea of baptism taking away original sin, the Eucharist, the sacrifice of Christ occurs each time the Mass is done. Marriage, power to allow or refuse a union was there with those ordained priests. Penance, or what's sometimes called reconciliation, gives the priest the power to say you need to do this for your contrition and confession and satisfaction and absolution. In other words, he can tell them, you do this many Our Fathers, this many Hail Marys, this many candles lit, all of these kind of things. The priest has the ability to require him those acts of penance in order to be reconciled. 
You have unction, which is the power to anoint the sick so that they can be forgiven of any sins. The grace comes upon them at that point. That's why you see them sometimes in battle. These Catholic priests will go and do that. Or you have them claiming the confirmation that since you baptize infants and, and infants do not believe, then you've got to have confirmation because we need to believe and be baptized. So what do they do? They switch them. They have first the baptism for the so-called inherited sin, which is a false doctrine. And then you have confirmation, the one who's already been baptized can now believe later on down the line. That's not at all what the New Testament teaches, but that's the concept of the sacrament there. And the final one, ordination, that a bishop or better gives the right for a priest to bestow that grace from the church. Well, now think about this. Remember that sacraments are totally controlled by the priests. So if you believe that, and you're in a time where you're here in Roman Catholicism, where the priest totally controls everything about those seven things, then let me ask you something. What kind of control would they have in a society that was fully Roman Catholic? They'd have absolute control. They'd have the control to tell you you could or you couldn't marry someone. Your baby may be or may not be baptized. All of these different things, they have the control of. You see the point we're bleeding toward when you go into the next section in the medieval times, there's going to be misuse of that power. Wherever you give that kind of a total power, there's going to be a misuse of it. And certainly there were in medieval times with Catholicism. When you look at the life of worship and doctrine also under Romanism or Roman Catholic Church, you had instrumental music introduced by the Roman Catholic Church. The New Testament is very clear. The command is to sing. A reference to singing is given there seven times. Never do you find play. Sometimes people use the idea that all the word psalo demands that. No, it does not. The idea of what psalo is to pluck, I believe is being used in the New Testament in uh, Ephesians chapter five. But what is the point? That which is being plucked is given. The instrument is the heart. The words are coming from our heart. It's not merely some kind of ritualism. It's that which is rendered from the heart of man. And as the New Testament gave that, the Old Testament was very clear in giving that there was to be instrumental music. Repeatedly, that is pointed out. But in the New Testament, it is very clear that there is no such command. The fact is that if we talk to historians, historians, regardless of what religious background they have, are in absolute agreement that in the first century church, there were no instruments of music. And apostolic fathers and apologists, when you look at their writings, those who are closer to that New Testament times, in every bit there, there is an often discussion of the singing. Why is it that none of them speak about instrumental music in worship to God there? When you have the fourth and fifth centuries come along as Catholicism is developing, they get special singers and choirs because it's more about the performance about the beauty of the music than about the words being given. And so what happens? They start to add that in. In the seventh century, the 600s, the organ was introduced, but it was not in general use for another hundred years or more. You had monasticism that was developed in Catholicism. The idea of the Gnostics was that if you live truly holy, you live separate from everyone else. They believed that that holiness was increased by depriving yourself of all pleasures in this earth. Now, is that what's taught in the New Testament? No, those things of denying the indulgence of the flesh have nothing to do with that. 
Colossians chapter 3 points out. But that's not what's taught here. When you look at the controversy over human will, this is where you get down to the beginning of what's going to be even more of a problem as it comes up. Pelagius taught in about, the, about 400. He taught that man has free will to resist sin. But Augustinian thought was, no, man is stained by original sin and he is unable to will something himself. God has to make him will to do good. He couldn't do that himself before God regenerated him. Now, what do all of these do? What all of these do is one by one, they change. Has there been any change in scripture? No. No claim of change in scripture at all. What brought all of these about? These activities were brought about because that is what is the collective will of the bishops. They add, they subtract, and they have their own human thought that over time comes in and changes what is the will of God. You see the point? How did we start that? with the first step that turned away from the Bible and got the idea of what is my desire, that was the time the whole thing began. If it wasn't stopped at that point, it would surely go on. Now what do we need to do? What we need to do is go back to the Bible. Let that be our guide. That is the clear point that all scripture, not the councils, not the bishops, all scripture is inspired of God and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped to every good work. You see how simple it is? If we go back to the Bible and just live according to what it says, neither adding nor subtracting, what will we be? We'll be simply Christians, like they were in New Testament time. We won't follow the apostasies of man, what is the various changing wills. God has a will that he had from eternity past. Ephesians point out it to us that that was his plan to bring us to that will. My friends, we do not come closer to God by subscribing to the doctrines of men. We come closer to God by coming to his doctrine, not going beyond it, but affirming simply what the word of God says. Thank you so much for joining us during this time. As we said, next time, hope you'll look at uh, these lessons. They'll also be on Thursday night at uh, 7 o'clock. I think about three or four weeks. Uh, I'll put a note up before that time. But about three or four weeks from tonight is when we'll probably start uh, that church history during the medieval times. And it will only be four lessons long in that section. If you can join us, we'd love to have you. Thank you so much for being with us. May God bless you. Good night.